How roughly was defended by Nicholas? When skies are darkest and storms are gathering figures overhead, the star of love will oft shine out with greatest brilliancy. And so, while Mistress Nutter was hurling defiance against her walls at gate and laughing their menaces to scorn, while those very foes were threatening Alison's liberty and life, she had become wholly insensible to the peril and borrowing earth, and almost unconscious of any other presence save that of Richard, now a avowed lover, for impelled by the irresistible violence of his feelings, the young man had chosen that moment, apparently so unpropitious and so fraught with danger and alarm, for the declaration of his passion and the other of his life in her service. A few low murmured words were all Alison could utter in reply, but they were enough. They told Richard his passion was requited and his devotion fully appreciated. Sweet were those moments of Sweet or sad, like Alison, her lover had become insensible to all around him, engrossed by one thought and one object. He was lost to all else, and was only at his last aroused to what was passing by the squire, who, having good naturedly removed to a little distance from the pair, now gave utterance to a low whistle to let them know that Mistress Nutter was coming towards them. The lady, however, did not stop, but motioning them follow, entered the house. You have heard what has passed, she said. In an hour our Master Norwell threatens to return and arrest me and Alison. That shall never be, cried Richard, with a passionate look at the young girl. We will defend you with our lives. Much may be done in an hour, observed Nicholas to Mistress Nutter. And my advice to you is to use this time allowed you in making good your retreat, so that when the horse come back, they may find the dull slawn. I have no intention of quitting my dull cart, replied Mistress Nutter with a bitter smile. Unless you are forcibly taken from me, I suppose, said the squire, contingency not not impossible if you await Roger Norwell's return. This time, be assured, you will not go away empty and You may not go away at all, rejoined Mistress Nutter sternly. Then you mean to make a determined resistance, said Nicholas. Recollect that you are resisting the law. I wish I could induce you to resort to the safer expedient of light. This fair is already dark and flexed enough and does not require further complication. Find any place of concealment, no matter where, till some arrangement can be made with Roger Norwell. I would rather urge you to Fly, Nicholas rejoined the lady, for it is evident you have strong misgivings as to the justice of my cause, and would not willingly compromise yourself, and will not surrender to this magistrate, considering that my life would assuredly be forfeited, for my innocence would never be established before the iniquitous and bloody tribunal to which I should be brought. Neither for the same reason will I surrender Alison, who, with a refinement of malignity, has been similarly accused. I shall now proceed to make preparations for my defence. Go if you think fitting or say, but if you do say, I shall calculate upon your active services. You may, replied the squire, whatever I may think. I admire your spirit and will stand by you. The time is passing and the fall will return and find us engaged in deliberation when we ought to be prepared. You have a dozen men on the premises on whom you can rely. Half of these must be placed at the back of the house to prevent any entrance from being affected in that quarter. The rest can remain within the entrance hall and be ready to rush forth when summoned by us, but we will not so summon them unless we are hardly to it, and their aid is indispensable. All should be well armed, but I trust this will not have to use their weapons. Are you agreed to this, madam? I am, replied Mistress Nutter, and I will give instant direction that your wishes are complied with. All approaches to the back of the house shall be strictly guarded as you direct, and my trusty man, Blackadder, on whose fidelity and courage I can entirely rely, shall take the command of the party in the hall and act under your orders. Your prowess will not be unobserved, or Alison and I shall be in the upper room commanding the garden, whence we can see all that takes place. A slight smile was exchanged between the lovers, but it was evident from her anxious looks that Alison did not share in Richard's confidence. An opportunity, however, was presently afforded him of again endeavouring to reassure her. For Mr. Snutter went forth to give Blackadder his orders, and Nicholas betook himself to the back of the house to ascertain from personal inspection its chance of security. You are still uneasy, dear Alison, said Richard, taking her hand, but do not be cast down, nor harm shall befall you. It is not for myself I am apprehensive, she replied, but for you who are about to expose yourself to needless risk in this encounter, and if anything should happen to you, I shall be forever wretched. I would have rather you left me to my fate, and can you think I would allow you to be borne away a captive to 
ignominy in certain destruction, cried Richard. No, I will shed my heart's best blood before such a calamity shall occur. Alas, said Alison, I have no means of requiting your devotion. All I can offer you in return is my love, and that I fear will prove fatal to you. Oh, do not say so, cried Richard. Why should this sad presentiment still haunt you? I strove to chase it away just now, and hoped I had succeeded. You are dearer to me than life. Why, therefore, should I not risk it in your defence? And why should your love prove fatal to me? I know not, replied Alison, in a tone of deepest anguish. But I feel as if my destiny were evil, and that against my will I shall drag those I most love on earth into the same dark hole with myself. I have the greatest affection for your sister Dorothy, and yet I have been the unconscious instrument of injury to her. And you too, Richard, who are yet dearer to me, are now put in peril on my account. I fear too, when you know my whole history, you will think of me as a thing of evil and shun me. What mean you, Alison? cried he. Richard, I can have no secrets from you, she replied, and though I was forbidden to tell you that I am now about to disclose, I will not withhold it. I was born in this house, and I am the daughter of its mistress. You tell me only what I guessed, Alison, rejoined the young man, but I see nothing in this why I should shun you. Alison hid her face for a moment in her hands, and then looking up, said wildly and hurriedly, Would I had never known the secret of my birth, or knowing it had never seen what I beheld last night. What did you behold? asked Richard Rayleigh, agitated. Enough to convince me that in gaining a mother I was lost myself, replied Alison. For all, oh, how can I survive the shock of telling you I am bound by ties that can never be severed to one abandoned the life of God and man who has devoted herself to find pity me, Richard pity me and shun me. There was a moment's dreadful pause which the young man was unable to break. Was I not right in saying my love would be fatal to you, continued Alison. Fly from me while you can, Richard. Fly from this house or you are lost forever. Never, never, I will not stir without you, cried Richard. Come with me and escape all the dangers by which you are menaced and will leave your sinning parent to the doom she so richly merits. No, no, simple though she be, she is still my mother. I cannot leave her, cried Alison. If you say I say by the consequences what they may, replied the young man, but you have rendered my arm powerless by what you have told me. How can I defend one whom I know to be guilty? Therefore I urge you to fly, she rejoined. I can reconcile myself to it thus, said Richard, in defending you whom I know to be innocent. I cannot avoid defending her. The plea is not a good one, but it will suffice to ally my scruples of conscience. At this moment, Mistress Nutter entered the hall, followed by Black Adder and three other men, armed with calivers. All is ready, Richard, she said, and it wants but a few minutes of the appointed time. Perhaps you shrink from the task you have undertaken, she added, regarding him sharply. If so, say so at once, and I will adopt my own line of defence. Nay, I shall be ready to go forth in a moment, rejoined the young man, glancing at Alison. Where is Nicholas? Here, replied the squire, clapping him on the shoulder. All is secure at the back of the house, and the horses are coming round. We must mount at once. Richard arose without a word. Blackadder will attend to your orders, said Mistress Nutter. He only awaits a sign from you to issue forth with his three companions, so to fire through the windows upon the aggressors, if you see occasion for it. I trust it will not come to such a pass, rejoined the squire. A few blows from these weapons will convince them we are in earnest, and will, I hope, save further trouble. And as he spoke, he took down a couple of stout staves and gave one of them to Richard. Farewell then, Prius Chevaliers, cried Mistress Nutter with a better gaiety. Demean yourselves valiantly, and remember that bright eyes will be upon you. Now Alison to our chamber. Richard did not hazard a look at the young girl as she quitted the hall with her mother, but followed the squire mechanically into the garden where they found the horses. Scarcely were they mounted and a loud hubbub arising from the little village claimed that their opponents had arrived, and presently, after a large company of horse and foot appeared at the gate. At sight of the large force brought against them, the countenance of the squire lost its confident and jovial expression. He counted nearly forty men, each of whom was armed in some way or other, and began to fear the affair would terminate awkwardly and entail unpleasant consequences upon himself and his cousin. He was therefore by no means at his ease. As to Richard, he did not dare to ask himself how things would end, neither did he know how to act. His mind was in utter confusion, and his breast oppressed as if by a nightmare. He cast one look towards the open window, and beheld at it a white face of Mistress Nutter, intently gazing at what was going forward, but Alison was not to be seen. Within the last hour, the sky had darkened, and a heavy cloud hung over the house, threatening a storm. Richard thought it would come on fiercely and fast. Meanwhile, Roger Norwell had dismounted and advanced to the gate. Gentlemen, he cried, addressing the 
the two Ashersons. I expected to find free access given to me and my followers, but at these gates are still barred against me. I call upon you as loyal subjects of the king not to resist or impede the course of law, but to throw them instantly open. You must unbar them yourself, master. Nor well, replied Nicholas. We shall give you no help, nor offer any opposition, I hope, sir, said the magistrate sternly. You are twenty to one or thereabout, returned the squire with a laugh. We shall stand up all chance with you, but other defensive and offensive preparations have been made, I doubt not, said Norwell. Nay, I descry some armed men through the windows of the hall. Before coming to extremities, I will make a last appeal to you and your kinsmen. I have granted Mistress Nutter and the girl with her an hour's delay in the hope that, seeing the futility of resistance, they would quietly surrender. But I find my clemency thrown away, and undue advantage taken of the time allowed for a strike. Therefore, I shall show them no further consideration, but to you, my friends, I would offer a last warning. Forget not that you are acting in direct opposition to the law, that we are here armed with full authority and power to carry out our intentions, and that all opposition on your part will be fruitless, and will be visited upon you hereafter with severe pains and penalties. Forget not also that your characters will be irrecoverably damaged from your connection with party charged with the heinous offence of witchcraft. Meddle not, therefore, in the matter, but go your ways, or if you would act as this becomes you, aid me in the arrest of the offenders. Master Roger Norwell replied Nicholas, walking his horse slowly towards the gate. As you have given me a caution, I will give you one in return, and that is to put a bridle on your tongue when you address gentlemen, or by my fear, you are likely to get answers a little to your taste. You have said that our characters are likely to suffer in this transaction, but in my humble opinion, they will not suffer so much as your own. The magistrate who uses the arm of the law for purposes of private vengeance, and who brings a false and foul charge against his enemy, knowing that he cannot be repelled, is not entitled to any particular respect or honour. Thus have you acted towards Mistress Nutter, defeated by her in the boundary question. Without leaving its decision to those to whom you had referred it, you instantly accuse her of witchcraft and seek to destroy her, as well as an innocent and unoffending girl by whom she is attended. Is such conduct worthy of you, or likely to redound to your credit? I think not. But this is not all. Aided by your crafty and unscrupulous ally, Master Potts, you get together a number of Mistress Nutter's tenants, and by threats and misrepresentations, induce them to become instruments of your vengeance. But when these misguided men come to know the truth of the case, when they learn that you have no proofs whatsoever against Mistress Nutter, and that you are influenced solely by animosity to her, they are quite as likely to desert you as to stand by you. At all events, we are determined to resist this unjust arrest, and at the hazards of our lives to oppose your entrance into the house. Norwell and Potts were greatly exasperated by this speech, but they were little prepared for its consequences. Many of those who had been induced to accompany them, as had been shown, wavered in their resolution of acting against Mistress Nutter, but they now began to declare in her favour. In vain, Potts repeated all his former arguments. They were no longer of any avail. Of the troop assembled at the gate, more than half marched off and shaped their course towards the rear of the house. With what intention it was easy to surmise. While of those who remained, it was very doubtful whether the whole of them would act. The result of his oration was quite as surprising to Nicholas as to his opponents, and enchanted by the effect of his eloquence, he could not help glancing at the window where he perceived Mistress Nutter, whose smiles showed that she was equally well pleased. Seeing that if any further desertions took place, his chances would be at an end. With a menacing gesture at the squire, Roger Norwell ordered the entire commence immediately. While some of his men amongst whom were Baldwin and Old Britain battered against the gates with stones, another party headed by Potts scaled the walls, which, though a considerable height, presented more very serious obstacles in the way of active assailants. Elevated on the shoulders of Sparshot, Potts was soon on the summit of the wall and was about to drop into the garden when he heard a sound that caused him to suspend his intention. What are you about to do, cousin Nicholas? inquired Richard, as the word of assault was given by the magistrate. Let loose Mistress Nutter's staghounds upon them, replied the squire. They are kept in leash by a varlet stationed behind yon yew tree 
hedge who only waits my signal to let him slip By my baby's time he had it As he saw he applied a dog whistle to his lips Blowing a loud call It was immediately answered by a savage barking And half a dozen hounds of hair of prodigious size and power Resembling in make, colour and ferocity The Irish wolfhound bounded towards him Aha! exclaimed Nicholas clapping his hands to encourage them We could have dispersed the whole route with ease a silence Hi Tristan, hi Herbert, upon them, upon them It was the savage barking of the hounds that had caught the ears of the alarmed attorney And made him desirous to scramble back again But this was no such easy matter Far shots broad shoulders were wanting to place his feet upon And while he was bruising his knees against the roughened side of the wall In vain attempts to raise himself to the top of it unaided Hubert's sharp teeth met in the calf of his leg While those of Tristan were fixed in the skirts of his doublet and penetrated deeply into the flesh that filled it. A terrific yell proclaimed the attorney's anguish and alarm, and he redoubled his efforts to escape. But if before it was difficult to get up the feet, was now impossible. All he could do was to cling with desperation, tenacity to the coping of the wall, for he made no doubt it dragged down he should be torn in pieces. Roaring lustily for help, he besought Nicholas to have compassion upon him, but the squire appeared little moved by his distress, and laughed heartily at his yells and vocifications. You will not come again on a light errand in a hurry, I fancy, Master Potts, he said. I will not go to Master Nicholas, rejoined Potts, for it is sake or of these infernal hounds they will rend me asunder as they will fought. You were a funny fox in good street on the river, rejoined Nicholas, in a taunting tone, but will go hence if I liberate you. I will indeed, I will, replied Potts, and will no more molest the mistress under thundered Nicholas. Take heed with what you promise, roared Norwell from the other side of the wall. If you do not promise it, the hounds shall pull you down and make a meal of you, cried Nicholas. I do, I swear, whatever you desire, cried a terrified attorney. The hounds were then called off by the squire, and nerved by the cry, Pot sprang upon the wall and tumbled over it upon the other side, alighting upon the head of the respected and singular client who he brought to the ground. Meanwhile, all those unlucky persons who had succeeded in scaling the wall were attacked by the hounds and unable to stand against them, were chased around the garden to the infinite amusement of the squire. Frightened to death and unable otherwise to escape, but the gates allowed them no means of exit, the poor wretches fled towards the terrace overlooking Pendle Water, and leaping into the stream gained off the bank. There they were safe, for the hounds were not allowed to follow them further. In this way, the garden was completely cleared of the enemy, and Nicholas and Richard were left masters of the field. Leaning out the window, Mistress Nutter laughingly congratulated them on their success. And as no further disposition was manifested on the part of Norwell and such of his troop that remained to renew the attack, the contest for the present at least was supposed to get an end. By this time, also, intimation had been conveyed by the deserters from Norwell's troop, who it will be remembered, had made their way to the back of the premises that they were anxious to offer their services to Mistress Nutter, and as soon as this was told her, she ordered them to be admitted and descended to give them welcome. Thus things were a promising aspect for the besieged, while the assailing party were proportionately disheartened. Long ere this Baldwin and Old Mitten had desisted from their attempts to break open the gate, and indeed rejoined that such a barrier was imposed between them and the hounds whose furious onslaught their witness. Bolt was launched against these four to guardians of premises by the bearer of the crossbow, but the man proved but an indifferent marksman, for instead of hitting the hound, he disabled one of his companions who was battling with him. Finding things in this day, and that neither Norwell nor Hotz returned to their charge, while their followers were withdrawn from before the gate, Nicholas thought he might fairly infer that a victory had been attained. But like a prudent leader, he did not choose to expose himself to the enemy and absolutely yielded, and he therefore signed to Black Adder and his men to come forth from the hall. The orders were obeyed, not only by them, but by the Sahidas from the hostile troop, and some thirty men issued from the principal door, and ranging themselves upon the lawn, set up a deafening and triumphant shout, very different from that raised by the same individuals when under the command of Norwell. At the same moment, Mistress Nutter and Alison appeared at the door, and at the sight of them, the shouting was renewed. The unexpected turn in affairs had not been without its effect on Richard and Alison, and tended to revive the spirits of all. The immediate danger by which they were threatened had vanished, and time was given for the consideration of new plans. Richard had been firmly resolved to take no further 
heart and the three then she required for the protection of Alison and consequently it was no little satisfaction to him to reflect that the victory had been accomplished without him and by means which could not afterwards be questioned. Meanwhile Mistress Nutter rejoined Nicholas and the gates being unbarred by Bladder, they passed through them at a little distance stood Roger Norwell, now altogether abandoned except by his own immediate followers with Baldwin and Old Mitten. Paul Potts was lying on the ground piteous in mourning the lacerations his skin had undergone. Well you have got the worst of it Master Norwell said Nicholas as he and Mistress Nutter approached the discomfited magistrate and must own yourself fairly defeated. Defeated as I am I would rather be in my place than in yours sir retorted Norwell sourly. You have had a wholesome lesson read you Master Norwell said Mistress Nutter but I do not come hither to taunt you. I am quite satisfied with the victory I have obtained and I am anxious to put an end to the misunderstanding between us. I have no misunderstanding with you madam replied Norwell. I do not quarrel with persons like you but be assured though you may escape now a day of reckoning will come. Your chief cause of grievance against me I am aware replied Mistress Nutter calmly is that I have eaten you in the matter of the land. Now I have a proposal to make you reset in it. I cannot listen to it rejoined Norwell sternly. I can have no dealings with a witch. At this moment his cloak was looked behind by Potts who looked at him as much as to say do not exasperate her. Hear what she has got to offer. I shall be happy if you act as mediator between you if possible observed Nicholas. But in that case I must request you Master Norwell to abstain from any offensive language. What is it you have to propose to me then madam demanded the magistrate. Let come with me into the house and you shall hear replied Mistress Sunder. Norwell was about to refuse her peremptorily when his cloak was again plucked by Potts who whispered him to go. This is not a snare laid to entrap me madam, he said regarding the lady suspiciously. I will answer for her good faith in towards Nicholas. Norwell still hesitated but the counsel of his legal adviser was enforced by a heavy shower of rain which just then began to descend upon them. You can take shelter beneath my roof said Mistress Nutter and before the shower is over we can settle the matter and my my wounds can be dressed at the same time, said Potts with a groan, but they pain me sorely. Black adder as a sovereign balsam, which with a patch or two of diacalon will make all right, replied Nicholas, unable to repress a laugh. Here lift him up between you, he added to the groom, and convey him into the house. The orders were obeyed, and Mistress Nutter led away through the now wide open gates. Her slow and majestic march by no means accelerated by the drenching shower. What Roger Norwell's sensations were at following her in such a way after his previous threat and boastings may be easily conceived.